The brain is a billion dollar asset. This makes many people hesitant to try out combat sports. Seeing brain damage as an inevitable price, one must pay to get involved. But I'm here to teach you a simple three-step formula you can use today to excel in martial arts without risking your brain health. These three steps will remove any guesswork from your decision-making process. My name is Jack Crucial. I'm an injury rehab and high performance consultant specializing in combat sports. My mission has been to revolutionize how martial artists train, focusing on elite athletic performance. If you find this approach to training and health as crucial as I do, consider subscribing. Whether you're stepping into a gym for the first time or preparing for a professional fight, this video will provide you with a clear formula to train effectively, minimize the risk of brain damage, and maximize your martial arts journey. Now, I understand there are countless fans of martial arts out there who've thought about training, but have held back, and honestly, I can't blame them, and here's why. The thought of stepping into the world of combat sports can be overwhelming. Many are intrigued by the idea, but are unsure about starting safely. The fear of injury or compromising their long-term health looms large, making this leap to training seem too risky. And over the years, we've watched many of our heroes deal with the after effects of entering the arena, not only in boxing or other combat sports, but also in high octane, full contact sports like American football, rugby, and so on. Muhammad Ali in his battle with Parkinson's disease immediately comes to mind here as we watched, cheered, and celebrated Ali's unbreakable will and the damage he was able to endure. We also observed the gradual toll it took on his mental health, serving as a stark reminder of the potential consequences of repeated head trauma and combat sports participation. Combat sports have a reputation of dangerous, grueling physically demanding training. Fill a gym with strong masculine figures and it's a recipe for sparring wars, showcasing your bravado behind closed doors in the gyms. A man's worth used to be directly tied to the amount of blood he could spill and was willing to spill of his own. Western boxing gyms have a reputation of hard sparring. It's rumored that Floyd Mayweather's gym has some fighters completing 15 to 20 minute straight rounds until one fighter either quits or gets knocked out cold. Dutch kickboxing also has a reputation of sparring very hard. Training the way you fight is the culture ingrained into this martial art. During the golden era of the UFC, guys like Matt Hughes, Vanderlei Silva, and more used to pride themselves on earning their stripes in the gym, engaging in legendary hard sparring sessions that would quickly sort out the serious fighters from the newcomers who just weren't cut out for it. It's entirely understandable that the fear of injury, alongside with the daunting examples of long-term health impacts we've seen in our heroes, could deter you from stepping into the ring or dojo. The thought of compromising not just your physical well-being, but also your cognitive function is a significant concern, especially for business professionals whose livelihoods depend on a sharp, strategic thinking and decision-making process. So what do you do if you want to learn how to fight and defend yourself without jeopardizing your long-term brain health. As someone who runs a business, but also wants to challenge myself in the sport of martial arts, I'm here to tell you there's a growing recognition of the importance of safety, brain health, and holistic well-being in modern martial arts. You can absolutely get the multitude of benefits combat sports provides, strength, speed, power, cardio, and the ability to protect your family without jeopardizing your long-term health in the process. In the modern era of combat sports, a paradigm shift is occurring, driven by a deeper understanding of brain health and its implications for athletes. Max Holloway shocked the world during his prime as a champion when he revealed that he stopped sparring during fight camps years ago. There's certain guys like Max Holloway doesn't even spar. He just fights. He says, I know how to fight. I don't want to get beat up in the gym and go into a fight compromise. He goes, I want to go in a fight 100%. Max was once a fighter who had a very real CTE concern brewing among his fan base. When an interview with Michael Bisping showcased Holloway slurring his words, displaying concussion-like symptoms. Well, Max, you say you feel great and you know, don't be offended when I say this. But you look like you just got out of bed. Are you tired? What's going on? How's the weight cut? You know, you drained. I mean, you, you look a little sleepy. Ah, uh, I'm good, man. I'm good. A little, a little bit tired. They got me doing a bunch of media stuff, but I'll be fine, man. I can't wait. I can't wait to All go right. out there and do that. Good thing. to know. This caused the UFC to withdraw him from his fight with Brian Ortega mere days before it went ahead. It's easy to see that Holloway, who is one of the most hit fighters in UFC history, decided that he needed to take a smarter approach with both his health and his longevity in the fight game. Conor McGregor and his coach John Kavanaugh have a very similar training philosophy, 
all the way back in 2017. He's getting the balance better now between yin and yang. That's how Marsh are supposed to train hard, sparring, and then the yang's supposed to be soft. You're supposed to keep yourself supple. But a lot of times fighters slip into the hard training and never balance it. Adding movement drills and flexibility exercises into his regimen, particularly highlighted in the build-up to his rematch with Nate Diaz in UFC 202, marked a significant departure from conventional brute force training methods. McGregor's work with movement coach Ido Portal introduced a novel aspect to MMA training, focusing on fluidity and body control. This approach challenged the notion that you had to kill yourself in the gym every single day to perform at the elite level. These modern warriors exemplify a new chapter in combat sports, where the emphasis on brain health and sustainable training practices is reshaping the landscape. Martial arts is evolving and our awareness of how to utilize its benefits has increased dramatically, both at the highest level and for any newcomer who decides to sign up for a membership. Training in mixed martial arts or any of its singular offshoots doesn't mean you need to pay your price in blood every month. In this video, we're turning the page to a new chapter, one where we don't just train hard, but we train smart. We'll explore a simple three-step formula to training safely in combat sports. Step one is choosing a gym or training facility. Choosing the right martial arts gym for your goals is one of the biggest training decisions you will make. The truth is, you will not change an environment. If everyone in the gym is going 100%, sparring as if they're getting a UFC contract from Dana White, this isn't going to change. Each gym has a different culture and way of training. The fact you may end up spending years and thousands of hours at a gym means it's a decision you should take seriously. You don't just choose the closest gym to your house or the best commercial brand name. This is how I suggest you should think when making this decision. Choosing a gym should be the same as choosing a house to live in. You don't just move into the first place you find, you do your research, you inspect different places, and you find the best fit based on your lifestyle. Just like you're more likely to get robbed in a neighborhood with a high crime rate, you're also more likely to be at a higher risk of concussions, brain injury, and trauma by training at a gym that has a culture where you're having sparring wars on a weekly basis, where you're not protecting your long-term health and longevity. When you think this way, you are far more likely to find a facility that promotes a safe and effective training experience. Martial arts is a lifelong journey. You don't get good overnight. So you need to find an environment that you feel comfortable in, and more importantly, one that keeps you in the gym for years to come. I suggest looking for an environment that not only nurtures technical and physical growth, but also minimizes the risk of concussions and other brain injuries, ensuring that martial arts remains a sustainable and enriching part of your life. To help you make this gym selection, I'm going to give you two key considerations to make this choice successfully. One is assessing your personal goals. If you are training in martial arts, you must clearly define your why. Do you want to be a professional fighter? Do you want to be capable of violence and defend yourself? Are you doing this for a fun form of fitness? I suggest you write down in as much detail as possible what your training goals are. The better you can define this, the better the training decisions and gym selection you will make. Having a clear understanding of what you wish to achieve through martial arts, whether it's competition, self-defense, fitness, or a combination of these, will give you clarity to guide your gym search towards facilities that best support your ambitions. Two is the gym culture and coaching staff. I suggest training at multiple gyms to see which best suits your personal goals. The most important aspect of a gym is that you feel comfortable and respected. Now, if you have professional fighting ambitions, you need to be in an environment with coaches and training partners that also compete and coach professionally. If you just want to use martial arts for the fitness component, this is less important. Each gym will have a different approach to how they structure training, sparring, and development of their athletes. A gym is only as good as its coaches. They play a massive role in the culture of the gym and ensuring safety of its members. The two things that I look out for in a good coach is do they prioritize teaching you defensive responsibility? The whole notion of needing to take a hit to give two back is outdated and prehistoric. The best coaches teach you how to hit and not get hit, which means they place a large emphasis on defensive responsibility. John Danaher, one of the best grappling coaches ever, ensures his athletes can defend and escape submissions as the number one priority. Then he focuses on offense. Placing importance on defense will ensure you're able to block, parry, roll, and control distance, which when you begin sparring, minimizes the amount of shots you're taking to the head. 
Secondly, do they prioritize long-term safety of their athletes? Martial arts is notorious for injuries, but it often comes down to mismanagement of the athletes. Yes, freak accidents happen, but that's not how every injury comes about. The art of coaching is developing athletes without breaking them. Your coach shouldn't be using you as a punching bag for professional fighters at the gym. The weekly training schedule should also be structured to maximize performance and recovery. I have a video teaching you how to structure your training like an elite fighter, which you can watch by clicking the link here. Look for gyms with a culture of safety, respect, and continuous learning. Coaches should prioritize defensive techniques and brain health, creating a training environment where you can thrive without unnecessary risks. To summarize this section, I've created a two-point checklist. I suggest you do the following. One, clearly define your training goals. What do you want to get out of martial arts training? What are your ambitions? The clearer the vision, the better. Two, visit multiple gyms. Talk to the coaches. Ask about their training philosophies. Because you know exactly what you want, the aim is to find a gym and coach that aligns with your goals. Trust your instincts about the place and the people there. No checklist can substitute for how a gym makes you feel. Selecting the right gym is one of the most important steps in your martial arts journey. By adopting a thoughtful, goal-oriented approach to gym selection, you can ensure a training experience that not only advances your martial arts skills, but also prioritizes your long-term health and well-being. And this then brings us to step two, which is sparring. Sparring is the highest risk, highest reward training you can do. It's an essential part of testing your progress, and it's the closest you will get to a live fighting simulation and as a result, has an excellent carryover to both self-defense and preparing for competition. Many fighters of times gone by used to pride themselves on earning their stripes in the gym, engaging in legendary hard sparring sessions that would quickly sort out the serious fighters from the newcomers who just weren't cut out for it. Now, this is certainly one way to approach a fighting career, and we've seen Sean Strickland achieve world championship status in the UFC using this method, but Strickland himself realizes that this comes with a heavy price on his long-term health. You're playing with fire if you allow yourself to take many hard shots to the head, if you treat every spar like a fight you're being paid for. High frequency, hard sparring is a recipe for concussions, brain trauma, and no longevity in the sport. It's a CTE speed run. These are real risks. Now, the best training facilities I've been to have a structured sparring regimen that factors in your experience levels and training goals. I was lucky enough to spend a couple of months training at Joe Lopez's gym, Freestyle MMA, home to Alex Volkanovsky. They apply the exact frameworks I'm going to share with you now. A structured sparring culture prevents a mismatch of training partners, emphasizes developing defensive skills, and continual growth in the sport. As a result, it reduces unnecessary head trauma by focusing on control, timing, precision, promoting a safe learning environment, and it allows martial artists that don't have professional ambitions to still develop fighting skills without having to sacrifice their brain health in the process. Not everyone wants to be the next Conor McGregor. Coach Farah Sahabi, George St. Pierre's previous MMA coach, adopted this very same philosophy where athletes are spending the bulk of their training doing light, technical sparring and drilling. In this section of the video, I'm going to provide you with sparring advice based on whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced level martial artist. I would classify a beginner as someone who is still learning all the basic strikes and defensive tactics. Athletes at this level should be spending a majority of their time becoming competent at the fundamentals. As a result, very light and technical drills should make up all of the sparring that you're doing at this level. Because you are essentially tapping your partner, it's something that can be done multiple times a week to get hundreds of reps in. This is incredibly important for beginners for the following two reasons. One is to ingrain good habits and technique. Because it's light, it allows you to spend time getting high volume of quality reps. The best way to learn a skill is by starting with slower, controlled movements, then increasing the speed once mastery of slower speeds has been developed. A common mistake beginners make is rushing to add speed too soon, which leads to ingraining bad habits and sloppy technique. Two is reducing the fear of getting hit. With light technical sparring, you learn to get comfortable in uncomfortable situations. If you throw yourself straight into the deep end of high intensity sparring, you will be afraid to let your combinations go. If you're afraid of throwing combinations in training, you won't get the reps needed to develop certain skills and it will leave holes in your game if you then decide to compete. Now, you may be thinking that light sparring won't help you develop as a fighter, but this couldn't be further from the truth. Traditional Muay Thai gyms place a large emphasis on light, 
playful sparring. It allows them to spar daily, safely, keeping things light, controlled, and focused on improving technique. This allows the development of hours of pattern recognition, decision making, and rhythm. Senchai, who is regarded as one of the best Muay Thai practitioners ever, is a product of tens of thousands of hours of technical sparring. The most important aspect of light sparring is the fact that you're lowering the risk of brain trauma in training, so you're getting all of the upside of skill development whilst minimizing brain damage. Sounds like a pretty good deal to me. At the beginner level, your sparring partners you work with are additionally incredibly important. Due to inexperience, some beginners may accidentally spar harder than they should. As a result, pairing two complete beginners together, especially if one is several weight classes above the other, is not a good idea. If you pair a beginner with someone who is at least an intermediate martial artist, they can dictate the pace and control of the spar, which is a much smarter approach. This phase of development should also be one where your coach is supervising you and your sparring partners to ensure proper sparring etiquette and respect is maintained. This then brings us to intermediate level sparring. I'll categorize the intermediate level martial artist as someone who has a grasp of all fundamentals, especially defense. They have accumulated a significant amount of time shadowboxing, hitting pads, and completing technical sparring. Many gyms struggle to bridge the gap between light, technical sparring, and hard, competition-based sparring. A great way I've seen gyms bridge this gap is with specific shot selection. Protecting yourself and your training partner should always be the number one priority. As a result, you can ramp up the intensity of sparring by throwing harder shots to the body while still keeping things light to the head. This gets you closer to fight intensity simulation whilst also protecting both your brain and your sparring partners too. Even for amateur and professional competitors, the majority of your sparring training volume should use this approach when sparring. Finally, advanced trainees and sparring. These are athletes who have high levels of fundamental mastery, have spent a long time sparring, and have competition-based goals such as amateur or professional fights. Because these athletes have so much experience, their ability to defend hard shots and have the conditioning to spar at higher intensity allows for some exposure to harder, more intense sparring. If your aim is to compete, it wouldn't be a very intelligent approach to not expose yourself to similar intensities that you'll be experiencing during a fight. This ensures that you have adequate conditioning to handle fight pace and make sure that you're adequately prepared. Sparring is the closest thing you'll get to a real fight and harder sparring should be used primarily as a peaking tool to prepare you for true fight intensity. This shouldn't be used all year round. However, competing in martial arts without having experienced the pressure and intensity of a real fight pace can be equally, if not more risky. Going from only light sparring to facing an opponent in a competition who's giving their all at 100% intensity can catch you off guard. Without prior exposure to such intensity, you might find yourself overwhelmed, an experience you'd want to avoid at all costs in a fight. This style of sparring is safest when you are not cutting weight, when you are very well hydrated and you have the highest levels of conditioning and defensive skills to handle the intensity of this level of sparring. Sparring depleted, dehydrated and fatigued is a recipe for CTE. Most high level modern MMA and striking gyms as a general rule do not have their athletes hard sparring more than once or twice per week. This is what the UFC Performance Institute in China does and many other world championship gyms. The sparring sessions are spread to the start and end of the week to ensure adequate recovery of both brain and body between sessions. Hard sparring is typically used as a peaking method for fighters who are close to competition. Veteran fighters need far less hard sparring and is why you see Max Holloway and many others drastically reduce hard sparring as they become more experienced for this very reason. To summarize the sparring section of this video, here are the key action items. If you're a beginner, spend all of your time with light, touch sparring to get used to the rhythm and fundamentals involved in sparring. If you're intermediate and advanced, the majority of your time should be spent ramping up the intensity to the body but keeping things light to the head. Hard or competition intensity sparring should be used as a peaking method. Prepare athletes who are amateur or professional fighters for the simulation of a real fight. Every coach will have their own way of doing things. I am simply providing a framework that is primarily centered around protecting your billion dollar asset, which is the brain. Sparring doesn't have to be a high risk, high reward training method, using the approach that I just outlined. This sparring strategy ensures that you get the most out of your training sessions without compromising your long-term brain health and well-being. This then brings us to the final step, step number three, hydration. 
Proper hydration is an absolute must for any martial artist, but it's more than just drinking water and hoping for the best. Many athletes just guess and hope that they are hydrating. Sparring when dehydrated is a recipe for disaster, and this is for several reasons. Firstly, we need to cover the effects of dehydration. Even a 2% fluid loss has been shown to negatively impact athletic performance. It makes training and competing feel harder and reduces your performance output decision-making, short-term memory, and alertness. In martial sports, where the stakes are high and where every split-second decision can mean victory or defeat, hydration is absolutely crucial. It also helps deliver oxygen to the brain, it helps cool your body through the sweat mechanism, but most importantly, it assists in brain protection and cushioning. The brain floats in a special fluid within the skull. Think of this as having a water-based airbag around your brain at all times. Much like an airbag, it provides a protective cushion against impact forces such as a punch or kick to the head. It absorbs forces that could otherwise directly injure brain tissue. When you are dehydrated, you have a smaller airbag around the brain. You lose the natural cushioning effect, which when sparring and competing, puts your brain at higher risk of injury and direct trauma. Not only is hydration crucial for brain injury prevention, but also for brain healing and concussions. Proper hydration isn't just for performance, but it's also for recovering from brain trauma. Even when discussing CTE, it's a combination of brain tissue dehydration and the effects of unresolved inflammation from repetitive injuries. As you can see, hydration is one of the most important elements to significantly minimizing brain damage and should be taken incredibly seriously by all martial artists. I'd even go as far as saying that you should not spar if you are dehydrated. That's how important this is. And that is why I'm going to share with you six key actions to hydrating the elite way. Action item one is adding hydration into your morning routine. Ask yourself this, do you drink fluids or water as soon as you wake up? If the answer is no, here is why you should. There are two times of the day when you lose the most fluid. One, while you are sleeping. Two, while you are training. So as soon as you wake up, drink half a liter or 16 ounces of water or fluids to replenish what you have lost overnight. This can be plain water, however, adding lemon and salt is a bonus. Even better, if you can add fluids that have a high vitamin and mineral content, such as fruits like watermelon and oranges, milk, bone broths, and herbal teas, you're taking your hydration to the next level if you are doing this. This is even more crucial if you're training in the morning, especially if you're sparring. Drinking half a liter or 16 ounces, two to three hours and 30 minutes before training will ensure you are well hydrated before you start exercising. And this takes us to action item number two, hydrating during training. Now, depending on your length of your training session, I'm going to give you two frameworks you can follow. The goal is to consume two to 300 mils or eight ounces of fluid every 20 to 30 minutes of training. You will then adjust whether you use just plain water or electrolyte drinks based on the following criteria. If the session is an hour or less, you can get away with just drinking water. If the session is longer than one hour or it's in hot conditions, alternating between water and sports drinks is recommended. Adjusting the ratio of water to sports drinks based on your individual needs, sweat loss, and environmental conditions is key. Action item three is hydration after training. The main principle of hydration after training is replacing what you lost over the course of the session. Most of what is lost is through sweat. So what are some of the factors that increases the amount that you sweat in a session? The length of the session, hot and humid climates, and the intensity of the session. Because everyone's different, a really easy way you can be more accurate with fluid intake post-training is weighing yourself before and after a session. The advantages of being a martial artist is most gyms will have scales, so you can track and record the water weight that you've lost, then continue hydrating in the two hour window after training until you're the same weight you were before the session. Start with water to quickly rehydrate. If you've exercised for over an hour, especially in the heat, or if your sweat is particularly salty, including a sports drink can help restore electrolyte balance and start the recovery process. Action item four, monitoring hydration levels. If you don't have a scale, another monitoring measure you can use is urine color. Aim for a pale straw colored urine. Darker urine suggests dehydration and sparring at this level of dehydration is a very stupid idea. As a general rule, you can use two formulas for daily fluid intake. Your body weight in kilograms times 30 to 35 mil or body weight in pounds times 0.5 to 0.6. So if you're an 80 kilo or 175 pound male, this would be 2.4 to 2.8 liters per day or 80 to 100 ounces. This is a rough guide as everyone's training and climate are different. Action item five mineral and electrolyte replacement. Hydration isn't just as simple as drinking water. There are two key elements 
to properly hydrating. One is fluid intake, two is mineral intake. Minerals or electrolytes are responsible for optimal function of your muscles, heart, and nervous system. Most well-designed sports drinks contain five specific electrolytes due to how important they are for athletic performance and bodily function. These are sodium, potassium, chloride, magnesium, and calcium. The question you may be asking yourself is how do I ensure I'm getting all of these minerals? The rule I follow with nutrition and hydration is always to get your fuel from premium, high-quality food sources. Lean meat sources, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and dairy will cover most of your vitamin and mineral needs. For brain health and athletic performance, carbohydrates are also incredibly important. Glucose is the primary energy source used by the brain and carbohydrates are rapidly broken down to produce this. The brain consumes 20% of our total glucose stores, even though the brain weighs 2% of our entire body weight. Glucose also enhances absorption of electrolytes and water into the cells of our body. And it's why most sports drinks contain a carbohydrate to promote this benefit. This brings us to action item six, which is sports drinks and supplementation. Now, when is electrolyte supplementation or sports drinks something to consider? Firstly, when you're someone who has long sessions of intense training. If you're training for hours on end where you aren't able to eat frequently, supplementing with a sports drink concoction can be beneficial. When you're training in incredibly hot climates and sweating a lot, this would be another instance where sports drink supplementation is a great idea. Training in Thailand immediately comes to mind here, where you're doing three hour sessions in very hot, humid conditions, getting your electrolyte intake from fluids can be absolutely essential. Now, I have no affiliation or sponsor with any sports drink. Just don't buy Prime. It does not contain sodium levels that adequately help with electrolyte balance. And sodium is what you typically lose the most of when you sweat. I personally prefer to consume non-processed products for hydration. Salt, watermelon, orange juices, and raw honey as my carbohydrate source in the session. As most of my training sessions are 1.5 to 2 hours and very rarely in very hot and humid climates, unless I'm traveling, I get the rest of my mineral sources from my meals. This is just my personal preference, but there are many sports drinks on the market that will do the same job. Because we're on the same topic of supplements, creatine is something I highly recommend fighting athletes take. I will now share with you why. Creatine is one of the most studied supplements in the world. Not only is it safe to use, but it's highly beneficial for athletic performance. It helps our body store our primary energy source, which is ATP, which boosts performance and power production as an athlete. More importantly, it aids with protection of your brain and cognitive enhancement. Creatine helps hydrate the cells of your body. If your body is able to hold onto more water, this also delays and reduces dehydration. If we go back to the water airbag analogy around our brain, it's a no-brainer to take something like creatine. Creatine is also neuroprotective, which means it protects the nervous system. Due to this neuroprotective nature, creatine has been shown to help neurological disorders like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and dementia. Not only this, but it can have antidepressant properties and can help repair and maintain the brain after head injury, which as a martial artist is incredibly valuable. So now that you know how creatine works and its benefits, how much do you take? Creatine needs to reach a saturation in the body to reap the benefits of supplementation. The commonly recommended dose is five grams of creatine per day. For larger individuals, 10 grams of creatine might be the best dosage for you to maximize the benefits of supplementation. Some people opt to do what is called a creatine load, which means taking larger doses of 25 grams for five to seven days, then dropping down to five to 10 grams. The aim of this is to hit creatine saturation in less time. When you take creatine, doesn't matter. Some take it in the mornings, some at night, others as pre-workout and others after their workout. So as long as you're taking it consistently, you'll get the benefits from it. Now, which creatine should you buy? The cheapest and most effective form of creatine is creatine monohydrate. It works just as well as the other forms, but this is the biggest bang for your buck. Once again, I'm not affiliated with any brand, so simply searching for creatine monohydrate and finding the cheapest one you can get your hands on does the trick. Now, you may be asking, are there any side effects of taking this? Creatine is safe. We will start with that but there may be a handful of things to consider when taking this supplement. Firstly, it can cause water retention, which isn't a bad thing, but if you have high blood pressure, this can cause a slight raise in blood pressure levels. Consult with a medical professional if you have any concerns. Additionally, if you're doing a weight cut for a fight where losing water weight is part of the process, it may be a good idea to stop taking one to two weeks before a water cut so you don't hold on to excess water. Another common issue people have with creatine usage is potential hair loss. 
but this is still something that can't be fully concluded from the research that has been conducted. It's likely that if this is going to be an issue for you, you would already be exhibiting signs of male pattern baldness. The health benefits of creatine are immense and its positive effects on brain protection makes it a staple in a martial artist's regimen to minimize brain damage. Hydration's role extends beyond merely quenching thirst or preventing heat stroke. It is a vital component of brain health, particularly for athletes engaged in sports with high concussion risks like martial arts. Proper hydration supports the brain's protective mechanism, aids in concussion recovery, and can mitigate long-term risks associated with repeat head impacts. As mixed martial arts continues to grow at an unprecedented rate, the importance of educating fighters and enthusiasts about the health of their most crucial asset, the brain, cannot be overstated. This explosive interest in the sport presents a unique opportunity to redefine the approach to training, emphasizing not just the development of physical skills, but also the protection and maintenance of cognitive health. With champions like Max Holloway and Conor McGregor setting new standards for smart training, we are ushered into a new era where the well-being of athletes is paramount. Now, let's dive into the concrete steps you can take today to ensure your martial arts journey is as rewarding as it is safe. Here's how you can train smart, fight hard, and protect your billion dollar asset, your brain. Choosing a gym or training facility. The action items here would be defining your martial arts goals, whether that's competition, self-defense, or fitness. Evaluating gyms based on their culture, coaching quality, and alignment with your goals. Prioritizing a gym that fosters a safe training environment, focusing on technical skill development, and minimizing head trauma. Two is integrating intelligent sparring practices. The action items for this would be engaging in light technical sparring to develop fundamentals and defensive tactics. For intermediate practitioners, increasing sparring intensity while maintaining head protection and advanced fighters should limit hard sparring to peak preparation periods, focusing on safety and smart training methodologies one to two times per week. Three is adopting an elite hydration and nutritional strategy. The action items here would be incorporating a morning hydration routine to replenish overnight fluid loss, maintaining hydration before, during, and after training sessions, adjusting intake based on intensity and the environment that you train in, replenishing minerals and electrolytes through quality food sources, and consider creatine supplementation for additional brain protection. It's crucial to understand that there are fundamentally two paths that you can take on your martial arts journey. Traditionally, many athletes have chosen to endure grueling, high-intensity sparring wars that mimic fight conditions as closely as possible several times a week. This path, while it may sharpen your instincts and prepare you for the physicality of a real fight, it comes with significant downsides. Increased risk of chronic brain damage. Regular hard sparring sessions significantly elevate the risk of concussions and CTE, leading to long-term neurological issues. Shortened career lifespan. Frequent exposure to high-impact hits to the head can shorten an athlete's active years in the sport forcing early retirement due to health concerns. Three, long-term health consequences. Beyond immediate injuries, the buildup effect of repeated head trauma can lead to persistent headaches, cognitive impairments, depression, or even changes in personality. Alternatively, you can apply the three-step formula that prioritizes brain health without sacrificing the quality and effectiveness of your preparation. This method includes an intelligent gym environment that protects the health of their athletes an intelligent sparring culture that emphasizes skill development and strategic thinking over brute force, reducing unnecessary head trauma. And finally, advanced recovery protocols, incorporating cutting edge nutrition and hydration strategies that support brain health alongside modern recovery techniques to ensure optimal performance and longevity. Applying these three steps allows you to not only safeguard your most valuable asset, which is your brain, but also set you up for a longer, more successful journey in martial arts. For those that aren't just here to take part, but here to take over, I'm in the process of creating the Elite Performers Club. This is an exclusive community where I have all of my training systems, philosophies, and cutting edge health strategies in one place. It's designed for dedicated athletes like you who seek to revolutionize their training approach, ensuring peak performance with a big focus on being an athlete for not just years to come, but for decades. To join the email waitlist, click the link in the description. The mission is to help as many athletes and martial artists around the world of all ages and abilities. So thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.